In this video we're going to talk about skeletal muscle and how it contracts. Specifically we'll be looking at excitation contraction coupling. There we go. So by way of outline we'll talk about the major steps involved in excitation contraction coupling. We'll focus on five major steps. Excitation, or the generation of a muscle action potential. We've talked a lot about that uh, when we discussed the nervous system. Then the second step is the release of calcium, which causes a third step, the exposing of actin. Fourth step, the power stroke, or the movement of the myosin. And then the fifth step to end the contraction is calcium reuptake. So those, again, are the, the major five steps of a muscle action. We'll go through these one by one. So the first step is excitation, is excitation, getting an action potential developed on the muscle itself. You have to go from having an action potential on the nerve to the muscle, right? And this is what how it happens. Uh, first, you have an action potential generated on the nerve and as that action potential or signal of voltage travels down to the end of the axon getting to the terminal or the bouton it causes the release of acetylcholine a neurotransmitter when acetylcholine is released out into the synaptic cleft uh, it will then bind to receptors on the muscle membrane acetylcholine receptors and when the acetylcholine binds to those receptors it allows for a little bit of sodium to flow into the cell. Once enough sodium flows into the cell it activates voltage gated sodium channels in the deeper part. Uh, so you have these acetylcholine receptors up here that receive the acetylcholine and cause a little bit of influx of sodium in and once enough sodium comes in it changes the voltage down here where you have voltage sensitive sodium channels and once those sense the change in voltage kind of like a threshold just in the the, the threshold that we discussed in the the nerve uh, there's like a threshold here once it reaches that threshold those sodium channels will open up allowing a ton of sodium to flow in causing an action potential and that action potential will spread all across the the muscle cell membrane the sarcolemma it doesn't travel in just one direction, going right or left, forward or backward. It actually goes all over. Uh, if you can envision a rock being thrown into a pond and how that wave goes in all directions, that's how an action potential travels across a muscle cell. It goes all over the muscle cell, and it will even travel down the invaginations of the muscle cell, the T-tubule, which we'll talk about next. So this, the action potential is terminated on the muscle cell or the signaling for contraction is terminated once the acetylcholine is gone. Can you can you appreciate that acetylcholine binding to the receptors is really what's causing that action potential to be generated. It's the trigger. And so you have to get acetylcholine out of the way for that signal for the action potential and subsequent tr contraction uh, to be terminated. And the way that the acetylcholine is taken out is, well, there's a couple of ways. First, it, the acetylcholine can diffuse out of the synaptic cleft and just go out into the interstitial fluid. Or it can be broken down by acetylcholine esterase. That's an enzyme, acetylcholine esterase, that will break it down and uh, call, help the, the nerve ending take the acetylcholine back up into it. Now, here's another illustration. This one I made myself. It's a little more zoomed in. So we have the nerve ending. Once the action potential reaches the end of the nerve, that action potential stimulates voltage sensitive calcium channels, which allows calcium to flow in. And that calcium then in turn causes acetylcholine to be excreted from the nerve ending. The acetylcholine then gets into the synaptic cleft or it binds onto the acetylcholine receptor that happens to be on the top of the muscle cell on the sarcolemma. When the acetylcholine binds to that receptor, the, the acetylcholine receptor allows sodium, a small amount of sodium, to come in. Every time an acetylcholine binds to a receptor, a little bit of sodium comes in. This is similar in concept to those EPSPs on the neuron, where it requires several 
acetylcholine is binding to a receptor to get up to threshold. Once enough sodium binds in, it changes the voltage enough to open up these voltage-sensitive or voltage-gated sodium channels. Once they're stimulated, the sodium flows into the muscle cell, a ton of it, causing an action potential that will travel all across. Then the signaling for the action potential and subsequent contractions is terminated when the enzyme acetylcholine esterase uh, attacks the acetylcholine and breaks it down, letting it be taken back up into the nerve ending, or when the acetylcholine just diffuses out of the way. Now, the second step is getting calcium release. So that action potential, this is the sarcolemma or the cell membrane, the action potential has been generated and now it's traveling all across the sarcolemma. So as it travels, it will go down these T-tubules and keep going, go down the next T-tubules. When the action potential goes down the T-tubules or the transverse tubules, it stimulates the dihydropyridine receptors or DHP receptors. These are voltage sensitive and they're linked to ryanidine receptors, which kind of act as a cork on the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the action potential hits the DHP receptors, causing them to move the ryanidine receptors and allow calcium to flow out of the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In this SR, it just think of it as a big calcium reservoir. There's a ton of calcium in here. So as soon as the cork is opened up, calcium just flows out rapidly. Eventually when the contraction has to end you have something called a circa pump, which we'll talk about in a minute, that takes the calcium back into the reservoir. But at this point we've had an action potential go down the T-tubule, stimulate the DHP and ryanidine receptors to allow calcium to flow out of the SR. Tons of calcium is now flowing out of the SR into the myofibril itself. And the reason for that is to expose actin. So the calcium diffuses throughout the muscle cell and binds to something called troponin. Now this troponin sits on top of actin. There's roughly one troponin for every six actin molecules, the actin being these little pearl strings here. The troponin is also connected to something called tropomyosin, this pink string. When calcium binds to the troponin, the troponin then moves and moves the tropomyosin with it. Now this is important because under normal conditions, resting conditions, the tropomyosin covers the spot where actin and myosin will interact. So this spot under resting conditions right here where the myosin and actin are touching, that'll be covered by the tropomyosin. So calcium comes in, causes troponin to move the tropomyosin out of the way, and that allows myosin and actin to then interact. This is a, another illustration of that where you can see calcium going to bind right here, calcium going to bind on troponin, thereby exposing the active site on the actin, making it possible for actin and myosin to interact. Now the next step with, is to have the actin and myosin interact, and this is called a power stroke. So with the active site exposed, the myosin can now connect to the, the actin. On your myosin head, uh, we'll start over here. On your myosin head, when ATP is around, the myosin is not connected to the actin. It's free, and so the muscle can move back and forth without having any interaction. The ATP, remember that's kind of like a battery, it charges all of our actions. That ATP is then broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And the reason it's broken down is to get energy out, and that energy is used to cock the myosin head back. See how it's gone from a bent, flex forward position, now it's extended back. Next step is to have the inorganic phosphate diffuse off, and once that diffuses off, the myosin head can now interact with the actin. It attaches on, and it's still in that stretch position. See how it's still cocked back? The next step is to have the, the ADP, this pink part, will now diffuse off, and as that diffuses off, the myosin head flexes back 
again, going back to that flexed forward position. And as it does that, it tugs the actin in towards itself, right? Now for the, the actin and myosin to not interact anymore, you need ATP back. So you have to have another ATP come floating around to get the myosin to detach from the actin in order to do another cross bridge cycle or another power stroke, more contraction. Without ATP, your actin and myosin will be stuck together, and that's what happens in rigor mortis. When a person dies, they don't, they're not making ATP anymore, and so there's not enough ATP around uh, to allow the actin and myosin to uh, stop interacting, and so they, they're stuck together, and that's what makes them stiff. Here's another example of this. So here in the starting position, we have ATP bound to the act, the myosin head. The actin is up here. With the ATP bound, myosin's not interacting with actin, and it's in a low energy flexed position. Next, the ATP is broken down by the enzyme myosin ATPase. And this is an important enzyme, which has implications for fiber types. Uh, fast and slow twitch fiber types have different kinds of myosin ATPase. So the ATP is broken down in ADP and in organic phosphate, causing it to go into that uh, extended position, a high energy stretched out position. Once the if inorganic phosphate diffuses off, the myosin and actin attach. Now the now attached, the ADP will diffuse off, and as it diffuses off, the myosin uh, flexes back forward, contracting again. And then in order for everything to proceed, you'll need another ATP to come back and do it all again. So that's how the contraction happens. And as long as you have calcium floating around in the cell and ATP, this cycle is just going to keep going and going and going. So in order for your contraction to stop, you need to get the calcium out of the inside of the cell. And that happens by pumping the calcium back into the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's done by something called the circa pump, the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. It's a mouthful, a circa pump. And remember the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a reservoir for calcium. That means it has a ton of calcium in it. And so there's going to be a lot of calcium in here and not a lot outside of it. And whenever you're pumping against a gradient, whenever you're putting something where there's already a lot of it, it requires ATP because you're going against a gradient. And so the circa pump uses ATP, breaks it down into ADP, takes some energy out of it to facilitate the movement of calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And once the calcium is back in there, the the troponin and tropomyosin move to cover up the binding sites on the actin and the contraction stops. Without, uh, without the calcium being resequestered, that's what it's called, sequestration or resequestration, without the calcium being taken back up into the SR, the, the contraction will continue or you'll at least be in this tense contracted state. The, your textbook has a pretty good description in it on table 8.1, giving a step-by-step -step summary of excitation contraction. I can't emphasize enough how critical this is for understanding what we'll talk about throughout the rest of the semester with exercise physiology. So make sure you understand it well. If not, feel free to come by and talk to me during my office hours. And that does it for this video.